Hey, yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, you are listening to the Old Culture Podcast, where the only inoculation we support is the one that alleviates all strains of fear. And buckle the fuck up, strap yourself down, because we're about to inject you with that antidote. My name is Ryan Peverly. I'm the purveyor of this here outfit. Welcome to the D program. And please do welcome back our guest for the third time, the one and only occult fan, a.k.a. Nathan Lee Miller Foster. Nathan Lee is a blogger at occultfan.com and host of the Six of Swords podcast, and we are going to dig deep into a piece of art that was forged by four of the most marvelous magicians of our modern era. Collectively, they are known as the band Tool, one of the preeminent musical forces roaming the realm here today. Their latest album, Fear Inoculum, is their first in 13 years, highly anticipated by both fans and critics alike, and from the sounds of things, was well worth the wait. But this is not a critical review of that album. This is a complete and total thematic deconstruction of what this album is about, song by song, image by image, even tweet by tweet, because this is a band that has become known for their meticulousness. Every riff, every polyrhythm, every lyric, every liner note, Every visual set piece associated with their musical catalog is carefully curated and then deeply dissected by their rabid fan base, for better or for worse, but always in good fun and good faith. Nathan Lee and I did this way back in episode 35 for another album by the band, so we figured, hey, why not do it again and share it with all of you? Because when we started to dig into this from a thematic standpoint, we found such a rich message laced with both apt cultural commentary and poignant interpersonal insight it's both a warning and a prescription as any piece of good art is and whether you know the band or not or whether you've heard the music or not it's all kind of irrelevant for the purposes of this discussion unless you want to completely comprehend all of nathan lee's references that stem from his extensive knowledge of the band and their history anyway enough opening act let's ring the bell on the main event and welcome nathan lee miller foster back into the house our house your house right after this The time has come to unshackle the beast that you have feared for so long. Relinquish your fear and submit to the cause. You will find all you need in these audio recordings. The year is 1990. Welcome to a culture. Nathan Lee Miller Foster, a.k.a. Occult Fan. Welcome back to the show, man. It's been a minute. Looking forward to the chat for sure. It has been. Um, Actually, to count the exact minutes, it's been... Well, anyways, yeah, man, I'm glad to see you, and this is going to be a good talk today. <laughs> this is a long-awaited album, and I'm sure it's a long-awaited chat. I'm sure it is, yeah. It's, uh, it's Tool's first album in 13 years, and what better way to celebrate this occasion than to completely deconstruct what the hell it may mean you know so uh, we've been waiting as tool fans we've been waiting a long time for this and you know tool fans get a bad rap for being maybe a little too meticulous about their interpretations of things but i think that (laughs) based on our last chat about tool which we talked about the holy gift i don't even know how long ago that was now but good response to that i think we'll get a, a similar level of conversation here so you know we get into the album it's called fear inoculum and you know, before we get into like what that may mean, I just want to preface this by saying that, you know, I don't know if you've if you saw the band's comment about what this means, but Maynard himself said in an interview with Revolver, so the uh, the overall meaning of this album, the subject matter from their own voice, which we can, you know, take what we will from it, but it centers on the effects of growing older and becoming wiser as a result of the aging process. So that's what they say it's about. I think we should keep that in mind. We'll dig into some other things too that, about what it may mean. But I don't know if you knew that before. Did you know that, that they've, that they've said that? Yes, I, I read that. That was one of the only things that I've done as far as like reading goes as far as this. I've actually looked up the lyrics to The Tempest or The Zevempest or whatever, but the way that I work at things is I like to do it from my own perspective. That's I find that I have enough going on that external influences often are frustrating to me at times. Like 
For example, just the spoiler alert effect, quote unquote, someone even tells me that a certain actors in a movie that can, I don't like that. So it's the same thing for this. I'm trying to feel it out from what my real authentic stance is. That's really one of the only things that I've heard about this album is that it was about growing wiser. Trying to pass that information on, I should add. I think that was right. the main thing. They want other people to get wiser. Then the other thing, I'm sorry, the sevens, that should be added. Um, that's a, a focus on this album as well. That's one thing I know. Yeah, yeah, I know that too. I think they recorded the entire album in seven, which um, we can you know talk about that later too. But So if you had to describe then from your perspective, in one sentence, if you can, if you have to go longer, that's fine. But as brief as you can, what would you say the theme of the album is to you from your perspective i think it's a condensed version to compare it to like the obvious project that i'm working on with the holy gift i think it's a condensed intensified version of some of the important lessons on that album oh you asked for one sentence huh okay it's um let's try one sentence to to one sentence i'll simply say it's the it's the it's the most modern, re- evolved, revamped, intense parts of Tool. Like they use a lot of different riffs from all sounds of their, you know, from their original EP to up to modern times. It sounds like they've taken, like, as if each album was an element to make this condensed, like, quickening album almost. And I think they want people to get their shit together. I think there's, they really do want people to question authority. Everything we said before, but now they're like, dude. It's been 13 years. Like we really, if we're going to have the impact, we want to see it and get people to be independent in that mental way and to be thinking for themselves and to be, you know, whatever, not like necessarily good people, but at least able to make the choice to be good or otherwise. So I think that this album's really a keen blade. Uh, They really, with a lot of force, you know, they released it at certain times and we'll get into that. But I think that's what this album is. I hope that answers the question. It does, and I agree with that, actually, 100%. The only thing I would add to that would be that I think it is about the internal struggle of doing all of those things that you talked about. You know, I think this is a very personal album for them. It's been a while, like you said. I think it's a very personal album, too, from if you looked at culture as, like, one persona. It's about the struggle that we've had individually, but it's also, I think, about the struggle that we've had internally, collectively. So, you know, that I think actually leads us into the first track, which is the title track, Fear Inoculum. And, you know, I think (laughs) the title itself is pretty self-explanatory. The lyrics are actually also, I think, pretty self-explanatory. But, you know, let's talk a little bit about this track. You can talk about how it sounds like, too, if you'd like, but I'm really in... Could I just add something I just realized about the F.I.? Fuck, dude. It's Fi. I thought about this being the sword in Skyward Sword. But I just realized FI is obviously the 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 sacred. It's PHI. <laughs> yeah. So they're saying well, FI. Actually, we should back up because I was going to talk about this later. But since you brought it up, the artwork for this album, especially their new logo, which you know they do change logos it seems every time they put out something new, and this logo, I don't know if you've seen any sort of breakdown of it, but the there penis are some... version. <laughs> Well, no, no, not the penis version. The the one that, well, maybe, yeah. That no, actually they, they might made a, a penis role. version of this one. You can actually cut it in half and then double it up, and it looks like the uh, Empire State Building or a giant penis. Okay, well, that actually makes sense because I have some notes about penises later, to be completely honest with you, uh, as it relates to this <laughs> album. Penisly honest. Right. <laughs> yeah, sure. But there's some other, uh, <laughs> some other esoteric angle into that logo and that it is the phi ratio the golden spiral is part of that logo lockup i don't know if you've seen anything about that or if you look at it now if you would would see that in the i think the O's yeah i the saw way. that yeah. yeah uh that was one of the cool things that we're doing leading up to the album which we should talk about how there's so much to this like how they led up to it like whatever that illuminati level beefs with justin bieber was but anyways no go ahead um, go I, ahead talk on that go ahead oh sure oh okay well i mean like <laughs> Dude, I my own weird way of looking at it was like, you know, there must be some kind of connections up the chain and maybe like this fabricated beaver beef. And now I say up the chain. Do I mean people planning this or do I mean like up, 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 like the Alex Gray art for this that several layers above consciously up. So we got this weird thing where like the guy was famous in the period who uh, where they were like totally null. You know, like he was the big thing when they were not. 
So it's like they anchored, like there was some spell anchoring. That's how I viewed it. I'm like, that's just, I'm the only one who sees it that way, I'm sure, and whatever. But like, it looked like they were anchoring their um, entire career from the point of 10,000 days up till this time and kind of doing some weird, like, sigil using that story to make up for that time or something was the that's that's the gist of the effect of why you know the whole and then his girlfriend's like oh you're not being nice after the bummer thing like there's all sorts of like life forms that seem to take on from a subtle angle if you will so that's what i have to say about that quick piece yeah, I don't know exactly the complete story about the Bieber beef. I know that he came out, Justin Bieber did, and said that he was a fan of the band. And I don't know if, if they responded bummer. to that. Yeah, they responded with that. I, I think it was Maynard that said bummer that <laughs> Bieber liked them, right? Which is interesting because Maynard's like, in a way, which was so ironic for how we grew up with him being like, oh, you think of Tool. Oh, Maynard, Maynard, Maynard. But really, the band is like, first of all, they wouldn't be without Danny. Danny took pity on them and joined. Then it's really Adam Jones's baby. They switched the basses in 94, 95 after uh, Chancellor released uh, the thing with Peach giving birth to a stone, which actually was one of my favorite albums in high school, mind you. I should add that. But uh, Chancellor joined the band. So the real two guys there, I'd say, is Adam and Danny. And there is Maynard who started it with, um, I believe he was starting it with Adam. But like, it really feels like this is Adam's baby and there's a lot of Danny, too. Justin's irre- irreplaceable. The thing about Maynard is he is too, but he also has what he's done is he's used Pussifer to clean up his brain. So the most important adult stuff goes on tool and the emotional stuff and the weird goth kid stuff goes with the perfect circle. It seems like, you know, so to bring that back around Maynard's an important part, but we always thought about Maynard, 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 which goes to the fact that, you know, he played the role in a way of the sun in the band and the, the attention was all on him which they brilliantly would alchemize by having him hide in the back, of course, but nonetheless, culture will what culture do. Yeah, I I think that's a great uh, sort of analysis, right? And you mentioned the timing, too. What did you find curious about the timing of all of this as well? I had the most interesting um, time leading up to this. Of course, we also add in the part where they release songs live, like A slash Descending before... So that's part of the entire, just like the album has two different versions in a way, the, all of this stuff is part of the um, the cloud, the, the zeitgeist of this, the, um, the glyph, okay? So it's all related, and you cannot get rid of the fact that they said A slash descending, just like there's kind of tracks that are filler and kind of not. So we consider everything that was official here. And um, leading up to it, they were like, when are we going to release it? When are we going to... They chose, just like we're in right now, we're at a 3% moon. We're in a waxing phase. They chose, I, I consulted a few different astrologer friends, like um, uh, the, the names don't matter, but you'll know their names if you listen to any, if you're into at all the occult. You'll, there's a few of them. And they, we, we talked about when would Tool release the album? One of them went straight to talking about how they might have done stuff with trines and tried to analyze their old albums. Another one looked for a good time for like really bright, flashy, powerful times. I don't know if any of them really got it. I don't recall. But from learning about that, what they ended up doing was a stellium, this crazy effing stellium in Virgo. Virgo, mutable earth, the pregnant womb, the place that you really want to have stuff happen in 9-11, cough. So you could look at... <laughs> so yeah, you see what I... <laughs> yeah. Anyways, no, and that was on a Mars day, people. You got to recognize that the two two-ers... Dude, I've been having crazy reckon. Anyways, we'll keep this on the. You got that's all you get about nine eleven people from the guy born eleven days after nine eleven. So they made this thing. Um, it was a new moon. Mercury, Mars, Venus, and the Sun were all like packed into the corner, right? And Virgo, and they got the love, and so you got male, female, just from the basic, basic. You got the light and the dark. You got the moon, the sun, and you got Mercury, which is a planet of creativity, intelligence, communication, and they're all in Virgo. And Jupiter's been Sagittarius right now still, too. So and there's a whole bunch of other things. Caps where it likes, uh, excuse me, Sag, wow, I'm me speaking English. Um, <laughs> the uh, planet Saturn is in Capricorn. Uh, Capricorn. I love Capricorn. Anyway, so the point is, is excellent. And this is like, the, no one guessed it, but this is the time that it should have been done, I think. This is the most possible, powerful time they could have dropped this uh, album this year. 
Do you think that, like, they waited 13 years for a reason, too? Because that number is pretty interesting. No, I think that there's, um, I think that they're subject to the same forces that we are, so that there are other things playing with us and moving us about on the chessboard that we either like to acknowledge or not, but it's fucking happening. Excuse my language. So basically, like, I don't think that they waited on purpose. I don't think that I, any human really can see all the way up. We got to get into later the artwork, of course, when I say see all the way up. But like, I think that the reason Danny Carey uses the Ace of Swords or the uh, Ace of Wands on his, when he's, I, I think it's during concerts or when he's writing or anyways, he uses the Ace of Swords, which represents the element of air at the station of um, Keter. Keter is the prima mover. So he's going all the way up for the highest because air goes above water, then fire, then earth in that order uh, for like the four different trees of life, right? Bria, um, Asia, whatever. So my point is, is that we're talking about this high level channeling going on. So 13 years to us again, and you hear like 13 years to a dog or, you know, it's different. Same concept in a way, though. 13 years might have been important to something else, but I don't think the band did it because they had that thing where they went through the litigation, this, that, the other thing. As far as I know from interviews or whatever, I've seen that they only spent like the usual amount of time on this album that they spend on any album, which was about five years. P.S. Having the synchronicity with five years, lots of David Bowie stuff going on in my life. That's a Stardust uh, song from 72. Jesus, man, I keep hearing five years, but there it is. They spent five years on this album. And uh, yeah, I don't know if they cha- uh, channeled or changed any of it except for the more recent stuff like the virgo thing they're like oh wait, now we got this when's the best time now and that's probably it maybe what do i know i don't know i don't have an answer so i'm just i'm just Same i like boat. the way that your brain works that's all i'm gonna say Me so he's stuffy <laughs> right yeah so let's get into the first track then fear inoculum yeah. and we talked about the theme of the album what do you make of this track symbolically thematically i mean i think it's pretty straightforward but you know i don't have the the sort of grounding in you know, all of the astrological, alchemical, magical stuff that you do. So I'm just curious what you make of this track. You sell yourself short, sir. You are, you are, you are quite learned. But uh, that being said, bloof, 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 make some silly noises. What am I doing here? Um, Fear inoculum. Yeah, I think it sounds pretty, uh, we'll start with the obvious. It's talking about exposing yourself to things. The only way that you can make an alchemical change, no pain, no gain. So the only way you can make an alchemical change is to actually fucking introduce chaotic or caustic agents. Danny Carey made a shirt with like a circle with all this chaos inside of it. I'm like, exactly. But like when you look at like what you have to go through to change, ain't nothing going to change if there's no impetus, you know, an object in motion. So basically, if you're inoculum saying, dude, the world's going to be best in our opinion, as tool making this album, because that's where we come from or whatever, that if everyone in the world would face their fucking fears and just be able to not crumble from that, but to grow and always go forward in this way. Like the art on the album, I'll just say, you know, you see the CD, the digital copy guy has the guy with his head going triple up or triple down, right? He's obviously getting dragged down to a negative spiral and this cat's on the upwards, right? So the way that I'm saying fear inoculum, if you expose yourself to fear, you'll go up. If you don't, guess what? You will descend into madness, which we'll talk about later, too, on one of the tracks, I'm sure. So Nice one. Yes. Yeah. So I want to uh, I'm going to balance that out a little bit and just kind of take that angle of the band's perspective on aging. You know, I, I do think I mean, it's pretty obvious track, I think, to interpret that you're just purging yourself of the fear, I think, that comes with aging, that you're somehow, I think, growing weaker and dumber. And like you're not in control of that process, you know, and that's not just speaking to the body. I think it speaks to the mind and the spirit as well. You know, aging is, I think, what you make of it. And it either empowers you with wisdom or I think it disempowers you with fear. And I think this is obviously about inoculating yourself against that fear that comes from not knowing what's next as you continue on your path. Because excellent. I, I think a lot of us still don't have this thing quite figured out as we get older and we're told we're supposed to or we're made to feel like we're supposed to, which I think is what creates that fear, actually, the expectations, you know, which in turn is what creates the psychological hurdles that I think the rest of the album speaks to as well. And I'll say that yeah, this song immediately spoke to me the first time I heard it, man. Like when I looked within myself as to why it resonated with me, like what I was fearful of, I think it was being able to connect better with myself and with other people. 
you know, fearing that as I get older, I'm not able to do that as well because I either can't get past, you know, my own traumas from, you know, years ago or that I don't want to because it would require me to personally change parts of myself that I've maybe grown used to or comfortable with, even though those parts are what may be ultimately holding me back, you know, from this connection with myself and with other people that I, you know, truly desire. So that's kind of what I took of it, or sorry, that's kind of what I took from it uh, yeah. from a personal standpoint, I guess. To to continue the the idea, because I love what you're saying, and I'm glad you said that, because I just turned 35, like a few days ago, a week ago, and I was obviously like, looking forward to this birthday for years because of the scene in Majora's mask where this character named Tingle, who was crucified on my birthday, by the way, <clears throat> says that Tingle's 35 and still doesn't have his fairy. And I was 16 when I played Majora's mask, which might be like my favorite game ever. I don't know. It's very occult. And um, I was thinking about like, Oh shit, 35. That's forever from now. You know what I mean? 35 is more than half a light. I'm 16. And I was thinking about this weird tingle guy, 35. So what I'm saying is that when I got to be 35, I, I needed to feel like I had achieved whatever he didn't. And by doing a certain level of initiations, by performing a particular number of rituals and taking in a particular amount of art that has changed me, I do feel that by 35, I had achieved what I had set out to do. But my point is, is that in 35, that's what? The age that you can be voted for president, right? But why is it that also in the tarot, the king and the queen are what you are ascribed to, not the prince and the princess at the age of 35? So I've just reached a threshold of age completely related to this album that we're speaking of now that you mention it, that I wouldn't have thought about. But you said it in a way that I hadn't seen. I'll say this, though. Bless this immunity. It sounds like he has the surety and confidence to know because he's approaching it from this angle that aging cannot affect him in that way that he has found the secure trajectory bless this immunity amen dude a fucking men to that now one other sort of occulted meaning that i saw pop up i think i saw somebody mention this on youtube somewhere but that if you broke down the word inoculum into a more religious connotation you get enoch of course, a prophet in the Abrahamic faiths, right? So there's that. And then you get the word ulum, U-L-U-M, which is the plural version of the word science in the Quran. And sorry, there's a, there's a fucking loud-ass car that just drove by. But, but I'll just repeat that so we can maybe get a better version of that. But, and then the word, I don't even know how you say it, but it, I think it's ulum, U-L-U-M, the plural version of the word science in the Quran. So it's an interesting, you know, fear, Enoch, Ulum. I don't know if there's a hidden meaning to that phrase. I don't know if you can make the case there. It's maybe a little too, you know, sort of in-depth. But, you know, combining the two, maybe you need to fear these false prophets that are societal, like religion and science or scientism, I guess. You know, both seem to have this grasp over our culture in this weird way where we just sort of blindly follow it. So... I don't know if maybe that also is, from a cultural perspective, the fear that we need to inoculate ourselves against. Oh, man, no, it's like, don't ever sell yourself short again, because that's the kind of poetry I like to hear spoken. Uh, that's, you know, you just did some profit shit right there, actually, to be clear. I'll say that, of course, Nathan, even though I'm a Nate or a Nathan Lee, <laughs> Nathan I-L is I-E-L. You can, in Gematria and the Kabbalist, substitute vowels at will. So you got I-E-L or E-E-L. Nathan Lee is Nathan I-L. It's just pretty to me. It's a family name, actually. That's why I uh, keep it around. But Enoch, Cohen, Chosen. Uh, because if you're the Cohens, right, uh, with a possessive, because note it's a possessive, a mammon, what? You get a Chosen when you rearrange Cohen and uh, Melchizedek and whatnot. Um, you know, the whole order of prophets and priests. And the Abrahamic is interesting. How does that relate to the Chinese cultures and the Arabians and the Brazilian? Like, what's the real world culture going on that's not being explicitly stated in the Abrahamic and all of this jazz? But yeah, man, I'm glad I haven't seen that yet. Like I said, I, I don't go looking for this kind of stuff right here. But um, yes, it's coming from a guy who's flagship podcast is science as being the six of swords 
and uh, you know, someone who's a prophetic type himself, I'll, I'll do this. I'll go for it. Um, yeah, I like your interpretation saying to inoculate yourself against the priest class because that would totally be opiate EP friendly. Um, but like, as far as just putting the two together from a different angle, um, like push it live, <laughs> um, you would see that maybe they're saying that if you can use these sciences, right? If you can use the holy science, that's the process. It's never just a, a physical thing. You have to keep in mind the metaphysical. So by doing that, you know, in, uh, the, the Kabbalistic thing, it's drawing in like all the occult right there. Like that's like, I like to say brother Joe Deserman, my first podcast on the six of swords, he's a chef. He says that, you know, he's got all these different things. And I say in the occult, it's like cooking. If you can do Jumatra, you can flambe, right? You, if you can do uh, <laughs> astrology, you can bake. So it's just like, you know, I mean, you can, you can make a waffle or cannabis waffle. And so um, you get basically this um, ability to understand all these different things, but they're adding this like main ingredient. They're like, hey, Gematria right there. So now you have to pay attention to it from that angle. Interesting. I don't know. Yeah, yeah I don't know. Um, I, I had a little bit more to say, but I think I'll be mercifully brief and just add that like people who are interested in that kind of thing should read Peter Lavenda's Oh, Gavalt. Well, have I, I, if you don't mind the burden of putting a link in there, but um, it's a um, oh gosh, what is it? The Stairway to Heaven? Yeah, Stairway to Heaven. Peter Lavenda's Stairway to Heaven about Merkaba Hekalet. That's um, chariot and um, throne mysticism in the Jewish tradition, matched with some Chinese. So actually, yeah, I heavily suggest people read that book. And uh, when we get to descending, I got another book for you. But one thing at a time. Perfect. Right, right. Now, uh, one more thing about this this opening track, too. A listener actually sent me a message on Facebook about this, that they thought it acted as like a divination ritual or like a detox ritual that sets you up for the rest of the album. So, I Oh, know. right. Yeah, I completely forgot about that. Yeah. Yeah, no, the, the whole... The... Yes, yeah. exactly. Um, no, dude, like... When the first time I listened to this album, I had like my big thing, but I didn't write anything down. I, I just kind of talked to the girlfriend and said, Hey, what did I say? <laughs> um, and so, yeah, that was definitely part of, you, you could feel them saying, Hey, it's been 13 years. Welcome back. You know, this is, this is it. Now you're in the zone. You're in, this is a very living album. I got to say that this has like a beef to it. <laughs> and I mean that in a good way. It's like, it's a meat room. You can step into made of sound. And he's right, or she's right, your listener, uh, is, um, that is something that I immediately was familiar with. And I was like looking, uh, the first few songs were a little hard to actually deconstruct because I was having visionary experiences during them. But um, yeah, that is definitely something I noticed. And there was something about the way that it sets up that space that reminded me of the way that the grudge starts with that. So there's yeah. that too. Absolutely. Yeah, there are a lot of similarities, like you said earlier, to their entire catalog that's led up to this, a lot of different sounds and, you know, themes that I think th this is almost like, you know, there's a lyric in one of the later songs about this being, you know, sort of their swan song or the epilogue of their career. I hope it's not, but if it is, I mean, this encapsulates this album encapsulates their entire sound into, you know, 87 minutes. So let's uh, move on to the next song. And this is uh, called Numa. Numa. Yeah. I Pete. love this song. This is my favorite. I'm sorry. To, I just had to say this with passion. Um, I, this is, I, I, everyone wants to say the Tempest or whatever, but Numa is my favorite song on the album. Uh, same. I would say same. I didn't like it at first, which is an interesting, you know, sort of journey for myself throughout this yeah. whole album. Like a lot of the album I had to get, I had to get used to it. You know how you do with the, a tool album, I guess. I I didn't like a lot of the songs at first, but upon repeated listenings, I just fell in love with them. And this, I think, is the best song on the album. I think this may be one of the best songs they've ever written. So uh, let's just tell people a little bit about what that word means. It's uh, spelled P-N-E-U-M-A. It's Latin for breath. It's also Greek for vital spirit, soul, or the creative force of a person. So that title, you know, is contextualized too, I think, in the lyrics. So uh, what do you think this song is about? Sorry, I, I have my mouth full and I'm trying to drink coffee. Um, speaking of vital force. <laughs> um, well, yeah, it's it's the one that <laughs> it really is like the heartbeat of everyone or something like that. It's really like the, you know, what a conspiracy is to together and to spy or respirate, breathe. And of course, you know, the lungs represent things symbolically, but we're, we're, I don't really know enough to go down that 
medical paths, to be honest with you, like the medical, um, what does it call it? Correspondences and stuff like that. Yeah. You know, like the heads, the Zodiac, you know, the Zodiac one being Aries and the head and Pisces of the feet and around and around we go. Um, but yeah, <sighs> this felt to me. And by the way, I was, this is fine to add. I was trying to eat some cannabis and I was trying to eat some cannabis as I was trying to answer you the other day. I was trying to eat some. I took a piece that was too large. It gets stuck in your throat because it's dry. And this is fine to add in here. Be careful when you're eating this while you're driving. Like, I couldn't breathe. So speaking of pneuma, I okay. literally was like, yeah, I giving yourself the Heimlich maneuver on Route 3 on Cape Cod is a, is a hell of a feat to stay in one lane. <laughs> oh, my God, dude. It's, no, it's a relevant story. So um, the heartbeat, because you can look at like the arteries on the highway <laughs> as little blood vessels. I'm just like, you know what I mean? Sure. As, the, yeah. as above picture for the, the heartbeat of us all. But yeah, man, like you can really feel like there must be some kind of like measured, like what's the human body tend to tick at kind of like dark side of the moon thing in this song. Like it seems like there's a real vital pulse that they tapped into that they wanted this to be like the sap of the blood of the tree of the human song. Um, it's beautiful. It has an amber color to it in a way. It's very lush and verdant. And I too had trouble with it at first. Um, I think you and I had a similar journey experience with the album it sounds like but you know it was enjoyable as music and you know but um you do have to get warmed up to these things because these are bigger than songs usually and i don't mean longer i mean bigger or maybe more dimensional ha, yes so um i think that numa is pretty much what you're saying i mean like that's the gist of it but like for me there's something about it that really calibrates me or something i don't know that's what i wanted to say yeah, I don't know. Gosh, I mean, I think it's it's a very superficial interpretation when you just look at the lyrics and what it's about in terms of, you know, I think this is this could act like the sort of spiritual awakening. Like after you do that detox in the first track and then here you have like opened up after you've sort of purged yourself from that fear and then now you're seeing, you know, like how connected you are to yourself, the one breath, you know, and then also to other people. So like for me personally, you know, I mentioned yeah. that, f that fear of connecting with myself on deeper levels or connecting with some other people on deeper right. levels. And like here, like now I, you know, purge myself of that fear. And now I'm opening up, you know, to that sort of oneness. I think that Cause we're all breathing. Speaking. We're all, yeah, that's absolutely. something that we all have to do. It's like in this book called mind mirror, you can go three minutes without air, three days without water, and three weeks without food. But the first one was air. So he's starting. It's kind of like what Parabola and Parable try to do, starting with keeping you in the body. This one's saying that. I, I don't know if it's a superficial. I would say, I mean, we're saying the same thing. I wouldn't say it's superficial at all. I think it's just cutting to the core of it. And it's we all are of one breath. And that's important. Why are we doing this work? Because we're trying to be together. We trying to co-create. Absolutely. And this is my first note about penises that I'm going to share right now about this song. So I, I found this on some website. I don't even remember where it was. I didn't copy the link. I should have. This might too. be hard to do, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, now so, we're boned. Right, okay, right. This well, this is, I don't know if this is related at all, but somebody commented somewhere on a forum or something. And they said that... If you just rearrange the E and the N in this word, you get the word penuma, P-E-N-U-M-A, which is a company that makes penis implants. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. Well, apparently the company also has been mentioned either as a sponsor or in passing on many Joe Rogan podcasts where Maynard has, you know, guested many times. So I, I just thought that was interesting. Now, I copied the comment and this is what the person said. I think this might be Maynard's crass humor. Panuma is a branded penile implant mentioned occasionally on the Joe Rogan show, where Maynard has been a guest on. The phrase bound to flesh in this song laments how we are tied to our sexual endowments and base desires. And after the operation, the child mentioned in the song is urged to show its growth and bestow its light. Remember, one of the other lyrics in the song may actually be re-member, with member being a synonym for penis. It sounds on the surface like Jungian philosophy, 
but it's more of an extended dick joke. <laughs> so that was the comment that I found somewhere. I thought that was hilarious. And I thought that, you know, Tool does have this this logo where they, they do have like this phallic wrench. You know, we've all seen it if we're Tool fans. And Tool yeah, itself. Yeah, they said that's what Tool is. It's a, yeah, it's a giant dick. Right. And that's what I'm saying. Tool, you know, is a yeah. sort of, well, it's, you know. Well, my answer yeah. is it's, that's, a, that's a fun this is why I, there's not enough time in the world sometimes to know everything. So you rely on the spirits around you to bring you things. And that yeah, that's an interpretation. I enjoy that. That's like how you can turn their logo into a dick. It's like <laughs> if that's if, if the highest shit's in there as above, so below the base joke is somehow able to be made through it, too. Uh, it's it's the ultimately enlightenment is fucking. And I mean that with mm-hmm. like on the soul level, though, and like people will the profane will hear that and think that I'm saying something else, maybe the less or more bent towards the other side of the yin yang, uh, the non profane side of the yin yang will think, uh, oh, yes, I see that's some kind of sacred flowering happening. You know what I mean? So, yeah, yeah. it's that. But it, it's also like, don't forget that that's an influence that can add to it. Like while it's like, because it's both of that. Yeah. He might've heard the Panuma, Panuma, Panuma. It's sunk into his consciousness and it could have like somehow just like been ready there so that they would say Numa later. I'm, I'm honestly trying to say this from a way of who knows how inspiration actually works. You know, I got a new license plate today, but like, who knows what that's supposed to mean. Also, you, know, you got what I'm saying, but anyways, yeah, who knows? Yeah. It's yeah, probably knows? both. Well, I, I think the best things work on multiple levels. And like, like you exactly. said, you know, there's the, the more sort of like, you know, higher spiritual level. And then there's the base, you know, sort of material level. And I think you have to look at it both ways. And I think that that's why their music has resonated with us throughout the years, because it really can be taken, you know, like with this really sort of like heady metaphysical approach. Yeah. But then there's also like we know Maynard is a comic on some level. He is funny. Hooker with a penis. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, so, I mean, it's, it's medicine, but it's tasty too. <laughs> absolutely. So the next track on this album is actually uh, an instrumental sort of interlude. It's called Litany Contre Le Pure. And it actually translates to Litany. Fear is the mind killer. Yeah. yeah. Litany against fear. And Litany has a religious meaning. You know, it's a series of petitions for use in church services or processions usually recited by the clergy and responded to in a recurring formula by the people. So that's an interesting uh, angle into that track. There are no lyrics uh, to it, but the title itself, I think, was worth just sort of throwing out there and then, you know, talking about what that means. So I think what they're saying is, you know, if you want to purge yourself of this fear, you have to keep doing these sort of tedious recitals or these tedious repetitions so that you can continue down that path. And I don't know if you have anything to add to that, but there it is. Well, all learning is remembering, so I'm never adding. <clears throat> but um, I will say that that is uh, from Dune, or that is at least something that's used in Dune, which David Lynch, aka Alan Smithy, directed. And uh, there's also there's your Twin Peaks tool connection right there. See if this, anyways. <laughs> oh God. Help us all. So um, <laughs> there's this litany against fear. And I like the way that you were saying that. The first thing, though, to that would be like, it almost sounds like if that's the priest up there saying that, and then you have to respond, like maybe cut out the middleman kind of thing. Sure. And so I thought you were going to go with that. But ultimately, I will. Not, I had a great friend who I used to listen to Third Eye with back in college. We would get really stoned and listen to Third Eye and both look at each other in amazement, knowing how great it was. Like, ah, we could see that blue creature. You know, we could see the somniferous almond eyes. Or No, that was a different song. Sorry. That was the same one. Anyways, no, the was, point, yeah. we could see that. Yeah. Oh, wait, that, that was yeah, Som- yeah, with the somniferous yeah. almond eyes. Yeah, so that's yeah. why, I, yeah. Great song, though. But the point is, is in Third Eye, we, got, we totally got it. So my idea, my idea here is that, like, Oh shoot! I think I might have spun off the uh, the end there. But anyways, it's a great. It's a. Oh yeah, he would say fear is the mind killer. It almost just happened. I started to get afraid of not remembering, but I nailed it. Um, fear is the mind killer, and it's so freaking true. And Paul Atreides, you know, he's obviously agent, special agent Dale Cooper, uh, born on two two two, mind you. Uh, so uh, that's uh, Kyle McLaughlin born on two two two. Um. When you look at how that's like the same 
concept of like that the holy gift is talking about for the phi up day awad if you get your mind in a jagged space you're going everywhere your energy is not able to be focused and effective for what you need it's basically fear is the it's almost like a power button you know what i mean there's that fight flight or freak out i don't know what's the other one (laughs) fight flight or um there's another one i think freeze yeah freeze so um with those kind of things, like if you if you get into fear, it overtakes you. And it's kind of interesting to think about metaphysically and what the void might be. But yeah, um, obviously, I'm a big proponent as a Pottermore sorted Gryffindor for courage. <laughs> so this to bring it back around. Yeah, man, um, this is to me a song about, you know, they're telling a story. Welcome back. Now we're all together. Now don't fear. Be brave. Be cool, baby. You know, uh, abide like the dude would abide and now we can go further because yeah. next we have that song that's actually 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 about aging it is it's called invincible it's the fourth track on the digital album uh the third track if you have the actual physical album but i think when you look at the lyrics of this it is really about struggling to remain relevant as you get older you know sort of like looking back on your youth and all the you know sort of success that you had you know hoping to just get one more I think victory in this battle of life so you can remain relevant. It seems like a very, I think, personal statement from Maynard on behalf of himself and maybe the band too. You know, they haven't been around for 13 years. Are they still relevant? Are they still this invincible warrior force? And that resonates with me too. You know, I'm about to turn 36 in November and I'm still trying to figure out, you know, what my path looks like as I get older. And you know, even in something as trivial as like a day job or like what I do for money, you know, like where's my or relevancy? Ship. Well, sure. Yeah, that's where I was going with the next actually, you know, but like where's my relevancy as I get older and sort of maybe like teeter on the brink of, of almost like obsolescence or maybe even obscurity and all those things that I had on my side in my youth, you know, like like my pride or my vim and my vigor, you know, my creative force, my pneuma, you know, where <laughs> is... Where is that now? Is it still inside of me as I've aged or has that fear, you know, zapped it from me? And like I said, you know, I said something trivial like a day job, but like you said, I said this up front, this album is about the internal struggle for me personally. And I think it's about the internal struggle for, you know, Maynard as well as he gets older. It's not just looking at like, oh, is my art still relevant? Is my creative force still relevant? Is my job still relevant? It is like, am I still relevant in my own life with the people that I have around me? You know, and oh, am, yeah. I, am I struggling with that? Am I struggling to remain sort of relevant in these relationships? And if so, like, what can I do to bring that back? And I think, you know, did you man, know that people love to hear their own name, Ryan? <laughs> is that why you just said it? So I'm actually meta contextually answering your question by saying that I've been having a similar and we'll, we'll get we'll get to the other meanings of this song because like this is just the, the this is going to be a good one. Um, yeah, I was thinking about how meaningful it would be for me to, you know, how would I want to feel about my presence in other people's lives? I was thinking this just like yesterday or the other day, which means that I was obviously thinking about it for now. If you know how that thinky thinking the thinky thing goes and so i was like i need to start corresponding with people more frequently just letters keeping touch seeing how other people are doing with a genuine interest nothing overbearing with like three paragraphs of this how's the stuff that you're into that you're working on how's that been how have you been since the last time hey how's the relationships you've had are you still at the same place like People, places, and activities, like keep it simple and interests or something, but just correspond with people, maybe according to a lunar schedule or I could zodiac that shit, maybe look at when their birthday is and then do it on the opposite time of the year. So I know I'm at least corresponding. So that's, you asked me how you can remain relevant. These are actual tips that we can use saying people's names, saying happy birthday when they say it's their birthday, that makes them feel special. And for some Times some parts of us don't want to give other people the special without them giving it to us first, because sometimes, God forbid, I should extend that vulnerable part of myself because that could get fucking chopped off. My hand could get lobbed right off and my pride and oh God, then the psychological thing that we all do by thinking and thinking and thinking that none of us talk about, but that we all do. Yeah. 
So if we're going to really become relevant, find a way to be useful in people's lives that's actually a genuinely needed. So why are they choosing this topic matter? It's like meta, right? But it's actually like it's needed and we need tool. Just like like I'm not a tool fan. I have to make this clear. I'm not. <laughs> this is very weird. I love them. But yeah, anyways, get the, get, getting to the main thread of this, that's one way we can remain relevant. The song is so, I'm feeling it already. I didn't know at 35 you crack and have pops and shit sometimes, but Jesus, 23-year-old <laughs> me, if you're listening somehow, dude, appreciate that shit because that's that, that really actually is real. That thing that people are saying about aging, that's real. It's it's not like, oh, that's way out there. That shit's real. So take care of your body and be in good health. Health is very important and treating other people very good is very important. Yeah, I think we overlook that. Like, especially when it comes to you mentioned psychological stuff, and we mentioned that too at the beginning of the chat. Like this album does have this sort of psychological, you know, theme to it. And I've struggled with that for many years, you know, having these just these terrible like self-sabotaging tendencies and this anxiety and this paranoia and depression. And like you just said too, we are all going through something like that on some level. So it's important to, you know, make that effort to just show people that they are important and that they matter. And what, what they're doing is, is, you know, relevant and how they feel is relevant. And yes, you know, I don't know if I have anything more to say on it than, than that, but it was. Um, May I add that the society we're in, if if you don't mind, just that we're made into boxes. Like we're supposed to be in boxes. That's why it's so fucking hard. I just, I. That's what you're saying. It's the reason. It's it's. Okay. Well, I just thought I'd add that. I don't mean to get you off the thing. I just thought that that would be relevant to add. No, it really is. I mean, we're talking to each other in a box right now. You know, it's a nice. I know. Digital frame here. So. Whatever. It's like, oh, God forbid they get the idea of they're actually connecting. Here, you're in a box. You're in a box. You're in a box. <laughs> right. Now, the next track is another uh, instrumental interlude. It's called Legion Inoculant. I don't really have anything to say on this. I didn't make any notes on it. Do you have any sort of you know, take on what this might yeah. mean? Yeah. There's a difference between that we're all connected and that we're all a Borg. There's a difference between liberty and freedom and justice and truth and um, tyranny and oppression and sleight of hand and manipulation. And the reason I say it like this is that I'd like to quote Chris Loring Knowles of Secret Sun when he says, better morgue than Borg. It's better dead than to be completely absorbed into something that is soulless and matrix, matrix-like. So like fear is one thing. Yeah, that's great. But what if you still are in, you're still brave, but you choose to take the, I don't know, the proverbial chip or something like that, the AI the the AI decision, the the, the 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 Satan handshake, if you will, the shit sandwich. Yeah. Uh, if you choose to go that route, you could do that, but without fear. But this one's saying, hey, no, always freedom. You can be brave and still be a slave. But that's not how this goes this time, my friends. Hmm. Very interesting. So that leads into the next track, Descending, and... I love this. Like you said, this was one of the the first tracks that they played live. They didn't play it in its entirety when they first started playing it. They just started playing like part of, you know, I think the um the long instrumental portion in the middle of it. They put it out with that A slash descending title. At least that's how it, w- it wound up on the internet. And I don't know if that was because they were deciding what to name it. Like maybe it was going to be called descending or maybe it was going to be called ascending. Regardless, I think that I mentioned Numa was like sort of the spiritual awakening song, you know, after you purge yourself of that fear. And there's lyrics in Numa about waking up and remembering, which we mentioned. But I think descending is the actual wake up call. I think that I think that this track is it seems to be showing you why you should wake up because we've all sort of descended into this madness individually and together and this toxicity. Oh, of you've our seen fear. my Twitter feed. <laughs> I have. <laughs> I have, yeah. <laughs> but I think that... Now it's nice. Now it's nice. Now it's very nice. <laughs> yeah, but I think that, you know, we have descended into this madness together. And, you know, with this this toxic culture that we've created based on our fears, you know, be it our individual fears that have, you know, manifested in ourselves or the collective fears manifested by whatever else, you know. And I think yeah. lyrics like stir us from our wanton slumber, mitigate our ruin, you know, things like that, rouse all from our apathy, 
Uh, Maynard has a lyric in this song that, you know, he calls this our own fable as if we've authored this story ourselves. And yeah. we have, you know, be it by ourselves or with each other, you know, sort of blindly it's pursuing. Called it's called dreaming. Sorry, yeah, absolutely. It's, no, it's called the, well, it's literally called the dreaming when you look at what's actually happening in reality, which is important to the point of this song. But that's we're literally in a dream. Right. I'm just putting yeah. that there. Just deal with it. <laughs> OK, go forward. <laughs> not you, but like everyone. Just well, go. I'm not really sure what I can add to that. I think. Yeah, 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 I think sorry. I was I think I was just trying to get to the point that we have all sort of blindly pursued or followed the wrong things because of maybe things like greed, you know, we're we're almost too comfortable with each other or with ourselves or with society that with our own madness, I guess. And that's yeah, actually yeah, yeah. it's actually like bred this divisive, you know, toxicity inside of us and with each other. And it's also bred, yeah. I think, versions of ourselves, you know, that are toxic Whoa. and Device well, yeah, with the shadow, with it, where the shadow took over, right? Sure, yeah, which was yeah, back to like that, the, the one that has, yeah, the one that has that face that looks down and like gets too happy at bad things, kind of shit. Like that's part of us all too, and that's a uh, people can get possessed by that, and that's not cool. Uh, but that's a that's a psychopath, uh, and we do not want those. So um, the idea is that like descending, you know, it's kind of like the geez, I feel like I want to say seven things right now and i can't even so we're gonna start we're just gonna jump back and hopefully we can spiral up to where i want to get to or past that the idea of a slash descending to just start at the beginning like the mad hatter says and when you come to the end stop <laughs> um you would see that this is like both it could be ascending or descending we don't know if they wanted to choose a different title but to me, in, intuitively, I knew that part of it was the philosopher Dane Redyar um, and his book on music and magic and the magic of music. And it has to do with pneumatic to, uh, um, forces and cyber, cymatics, which are obviously related. You can imagine like the different like, like what's my mood? You could see like which cymatic is pumping through my pneuma. And that's what my aura is, you know, like multiply by two dimensions and three dimensions and whatnot and lattices. I'm serious. Like that's the seed of life. And uh, anyways, when you have a manifestation occurring, which we are, we're a dream. We are actually, let me ask you this question because this is completely germane and we're going to go forward and it actually needs to be asked. And I, I mean, not just to you, Ryan, right now, but everyone hearing this, ask yourself this. I mentioned air and water and food earlier. But what was the one that I didn't mention? Sleep. Why do we need to go back to sleep? And why is it called back? <laughs> I'm just saying. So why do we sleep is the question to ask yourself. Why can we not do that for long? And the answer is this, in my opinion. Why do we sleep? Why do we go back to sleep? Why can we not go for long without sleeping? Or do we go cray cray? And then the world starts to break apart in front of us, which has to do with our perceptual uh, connection to the uh, consciousness. And it's like, why do you only get high when you smoke the weed? But anyways, well, yeah, there's another hole. But anyways, I will say that what I have kind of been struck with recently, because you and I are, I feel like you and I are on a really good vibe with a similar understanding of this. I feel like the album's having an awakening. And I mean, it's for what it is, we're the guys who are into the occult and here we are talking about it. You know what I mean? It's just kind of like if you get if you're picking up what I'm putting down, I got something wicked wacky to tell you later. If I if I feel comfortable enough, if I feel vulnerable enough to share it about mocking beat, I got some crazy fucking shit to say about that at the end. But all right, so here you and I are talking about this album, and I feel like you and I like you've had the same ideas waking up in you as I have in me, and that means other guys and girls are around the world, uh, you know, and everyone in between. So, anyways, Dane Rudyard talks about how manifestation occurs and how things kind of fold into being and the reason i'm bringing up dreaming is because just like the aborigines talk about the dream or kate bush's the dreaming this concept of my other famous my other favorite zelda game is Link's awakening it's the first one for the game boy it's the fourth zelda it came after the super nintendo one and it has this concept where i'm sorry my loves but spoiler alert you get to the end of the game, and all throughout the game, you're collecting eight different instruments of the siren. You get them, and you go to this tall mountain with an egg on top. You go into there, and you have to fight the nightmares, who have been warning you that if you wake this thing up, if you go and free, if you win the game, 
you too will disappear. The game starts when your ship gets hit by lightning and it breaks apart in the sea and you end up on the shores of this island. And this girl wakes you up and you have to do the thing and you get to this guy at the end of the game. You fight the nightmare. You kill it. You ascend even more crystalline rainbow stairs into the space now. Now it's stars all around you. And this rainbow windfish, this giant whale with a saddle and two floopy little wings, kind of just appears into being. And he says, good job, you beat the game, yada, yada. But now that you've done this, you too will disappear. And so the whole thing disappears. And that's the concept of the dreaming in a way, just as a, a video game, pop culture version of it. But I think that we literally are in a dream right now. And so descending and ascending is the different, you know, I saw, behold, I saw the angels ascending and descending. Um, it's the energetic matrix flow between Kether and Malkut, basically, in a way of putting it. But that's, that's basically the idea. So now if we're going to manifest this reality differently, it's going to manifest as above, so below. But now is the time to do it, if you get what I'm saying, to tie that all in. Yeah, I get what you're saying. Uh, I don't. Yeah, I don't have anything to add to that, to be honest. So, uh, if you have more to add, that's fine. But if not, let's just let's just go on to calling voices. Is that cool? I would say I would say the last thing. Um, I think that we got to that point I wanted to get to before and beyond it. I, I think that we actually uh, did quite well with that one. So, calling voices, man. The four degrees song, right? Very four degreesy in there. Yeah, yeah, that's the song off of the uh, Undertow album, if I'm not mistaken. My and favorite song on that album for a long time, and apparently yeah. Danny Carey used to make fun of it, and Adam, like, it was like a thing between Adam and Danny, like, Adam loved it. Anyways. Well, I think this is another one that Calling Voices is another track that is pretty obvious what it's about, you know? I think it's literally about silencing the voices that you have in your head, you know, the ones that are speaking to you out of fear the ones that are speaking to you out of anxiety you know or whatever it's it's sort of like trying to calm those <laughs> storms inside of you those psychological storms you know the the insecurities that you have with yourself and you know just shutting that down so you can continue on this path of you know i guess maybe alchemical transmutation would be the best way to describe it for this audience you know and i don't really have anything more to say about this because it to me it's pretty simple so but i am curious what you think of this track as it stands today, every time that you've finished asking a question, I'm just about ready to have my coffee, and I'm like, oh, yeah. Oh, no, he finished. Oh, I should no. probably be talking longer, man. I'm so sorry. Hey, you know what, though? I'm managing, you would never guess that I have a mouthful of cannabis right now. No, um, I, I can see I it, actually. I don't have to guess. I'm looking right at it. Oh, that's, 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 that's the audience that doesn't have to guess, though. Um, you know what, though? Cannabis and coffee, very good for you, I might add. And oh, I just became a knight of a different podcast called No Agenda, which people should listen to, and they should listen to a culture. But guess whose podcast got three different shout outs when I became a knight on No Agenda? I'm going to assume your own podcast probably was shouted out. Dude. Well, then that shows that we all have work to do together as a community, trusting each other more. But your show got three good, cool ass shout outs. I mentioned that we're going to be talking about Fear Knock and so people know this is going to be coming soon. Just like I'll be on the obelisk soon, since people be posting that stuff. But anyways, the point was, is that I talked about how um, I found out about their show from your show. But um, the reason I brought that up was that at the round table, when I became a knight, and my girlfriend actually knighted me with a proper sword and everything. It was cool as shit. I had Kona coffee and Maui Wowie. So just to the point of the thing. So Go calling together. voices, man. Sorry? No, I just said the Kona and the Maui go together, but go ahead. I think, like, Hawaii is the place that I'll end up burying my bones, but we'll see. <laughs> um, you know, I'm not even kidding, though. It's like at the base of a volcano or something. Awesome. Oh, no, throw my ashes in the volcano. Throw me in the volcano. Okay, that escalated quickly. There you go. So, anyways, yeah. <laughs> um, calling voices has a few different, like, there's that don't you dare point that at me part, you know, psycho what is it? Psych is it psychopathy? You know what I mean? He says, yeah, Don't could, you dare point. I can find a lyric real quick if you want it, but Yeah, yeah well no, but in, in in there's ways you could see it like saying telling someone else, Don't you dare point that at me, like don't tell me I am psychopathic, like how like as if like he's like you can't possibly he's experienced someone try to invalidate his worldview by saying that he's crazy. He's like, Don't you dare point that at me. Don't you dare point that ultimate invalidation at me. 
social invalidation of me. No, don't you dare. And it's also saying it from the internal point of view, calling the voices inside so that you can be focused enough so then you can act like a person who no one could dare call psychotic. That's kind of the idea. Get your shit together and then you're unassailable because from inside out, you're truly who you are. You're unshakable. You're a, you're a standing wave. You're a cool dude or dudette or person of whatever you want to be. Yeah, I need to personally, uh, you know, this track speaks to me too. I, I need to personally do that. I need to be more consistent with being myself and not letting those voices, you know, sort of control me. And the lyric that you're looking for, I, actually, I'm going to read the, it's the whole first sort of, I guess I'll call it a stanza of the song where Maynard sings, this, so this is actually how the song starts. Disembodied voices deepen my suspicious tendencies, conversations we've never had, imagined interplay, psychopathy, don't you dare point that at me. So... You know, that is interesting because I think a lot of what I was talking about earlier, you know, the anxiety and the paranoia comes from those disembodied voices that deepen those tendencies inside of me, you know, and I'm having yeah. conversations I'm having conversations with people that aren't even here that you know, yep. that's, that's what he's talking about, you know? So oh, I'll show you, I'll get the one over yeah. on you and you you fight you fight through the whole drama, the whole video game or the whole level of the whole cartoon episode of that revenge fantasy until oh now I'm better. Now this is, ha oh, you know what I mean, right? Like people need to get real with that. And that's, that's good that we can just like get that out there because humans throughout time have dealt with this. And we, as responsible adults, as people who want to make the world a better place, whatever that's called, and it's probably the wrong way to say it in a way, who want to dream a better dream, will say that we need to be better dreamers. There is, as Gordon White says, a war on dreaming. And we absolutely need to learn how to swim. And how, that is how to win the war, or at least to continually stead up to the breaches once more, you know? So anyways, I think this is all very important in that we need to like not let that Watiko, because ideas have people as much as people generate ideas. So you can, like Frederick Xavier of Mind and Magic says, the first thing to do, if there's that negative shit, banish that then invoke the one that you want. Just because you had the thought, just because the Watiko cloud floated through you doesn't mean you let that fart stay. You banish it because it's your sacred center of your consciousness. You are a created vessel uh, with a soul. So use your consciousness responsibly. Call those voices, okay? Cast out the Watiko. Cast out the bullshit. Just fuck it. Part of being a good person, part of my language, of course, is give no shit, but take no shit. It's the non-violence or the non-aggression principle. Anyways, that's what that's really a huge part. I'm glad we could tie the non-aggression to this idea of fixing up our psyches, you know, and not letting fear and dread get to us, but choosing the thoughts that are most fitting of courage and the best dream possible. Let me just say that when my mom was going through a writer's course when I was a boy, I remember her saying that something she learned was that they taught them to envision a stream that everyone's going down in a nice big old yellow floaty raft thing with the paddles. And there's a nice open stream. And suddenly there's to the left side of the stream, a giganto branch that's going to rip the thing to the right. There's clear water ahead. And so what she was taught and she taught me that day. And I remember I was like eight. She said, if you choose to go towards the open water, your raft will be fine. If you are thinking too much about the branches, you're going to be attracted to those branches and they will tear your vessel. And I was in Nantucket this past week. I was driving on some cobblestones on a scooter with my girlfriend on the back. And it wasn't enough for me to stay upright on that thing mentally by thinking I got to keep my girlfriend safe. I had to create a story in my head where I said, I have medicine on this that needs to get to the children that are at the hospital. So even though a nice lady mother with a baby it looked like she came from a Renoir painting, pointed us to the lighthouse where he wanted to go. We ended up with these cobblestones that I was terrified to go over. And I made up a story in my head. Like I'm saying we should do. I banished the negative and I brought in the positive. This is completely ludicrous. There's no children in the hospital I was trying to get to. But I got over those. And you don't understand Nantucket cobblestones. You need to look at them. On a scooter, on a Vespa, with two grown-ass adults, one of them was kind of like wiggling on the back. I love you, girlfriend. I love you, JJ. But anyway, so that's what I'm saying. You need to cull the voices of the negativity and replace them with a positive story in this dreaming manifestation and the manifestation will follow. So it seems to be. 
Man, you never cease to amaze me with your thought process here and your patterns of thinking. So, but I'd love to hear you talk about the next track. It's another instrumental. Yeah, sure. It's the longest instrumental on the album. It's over three minutes, and it's called Chocolate yeah. Chip Trip. And this is, you know, first of all, Danny Carey goes pretty hard on this entire album. Like you said, this is kind of Adam's baby. It's also Danny. I mean, I just I'm impressed with with Adam on this album, but I'm equally impressed with what Danny did throughout this these these tracks and. This is sort of like, you know, a little moment for Danny to shine. It's a very psychedelic, you know, sort of track. But the title's interesting, Chocolate Chip Trip. It's very playful. And I think it alludes to that aging process again, you know, about like, what are chocolate chips? You know, I mean, those are things that kids eat, you know, like chocolate chip cookies. It's very simple and reminds you of your youth, you know, just these sort of seemingly innocuous snacks, right? But then there's the trip portion of it where you're like, oh shit, like this track is pretty psychedelic. It does sound like a like an acid trip or of some sort, you know, and I don't know how the two mingle or interplay together, the, those two thoughts, but I'm very curious about what you make of this track. Well, it's uh, safe as cookies and cream as it seems. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> another innocuous, uh, I'm glad you used that word finally. It's like, someone's gotta. Um, it's like, huh. Um, uh, it's not good. So yeah, also definitely love my girlfriend. I was like, I shouldn't just be so flippant and say love my girl. Yeah, anyways, so now that we're listening to this, because she is a special lady. And now as I said this in this track, she's gonna always make me chocolate chip cookies when I'm tripping. It's a good spell. I love you, JJ. Make me cookies <laughs> yeah. when I'm tripping. All right, yeah. So I think it's fun. I think it's a great track that shows their sense of humor and playfulness, but I really do think like Ions and like Fab Day Awad, it's another one of Danny's like, oh, Danny gets to be crazy Danny. And he's just, fa- he, he wants to have, he's trying to make like what a stoner kid in the 60s would want to hear when they're tripping out, like when they just want to go crazy and have the most fun journey. So I think he tried to make that adding the intense drums that get punishing at some points. I'm like, oh. but it's like really intense. So it's supposed to be that way. It's supposed to be like, it's like the experience is throttling you and you're along, you know, you buy the ticket, take the ride. You know what I mean? It's like, this is bat country. <laughs> so yeah, um, it's exactly that. Yeah, chocolate chip trip is bat country. It's lovely. And um, I want to go back there. I thought it was such a fun song when I, when J, uh, when JJ and I were listening to it, I was saying to her that like, this is like also it's, it's multiple levels. Of course, one of the, one of the functions I think it has in this whole overall story is like a reset button. You know what I mean? Like reset me dot, or it's just reset dot me, which is totally appropriate to add here since we need to mention the psychedelics. Right. Right. So um, you got the whole idea that you're on a trip, but it's also fun. It's not a bad trip. It's chocolate chip trip, man. That was a fucking chocolate chip trip. It was squeezed out just perfectly. It's sweet and tasty. Now there's another one. I don't know. It's really good. Um, the, the overall vibe of the song is like almost mint chocolate chip to me. Uh, <laughs> it's like something really cool about the the, the kind of like, you can almost like see it in your head flashing and like swimming around and churning. So um, what else is there? To, I mean, this is probably the first tool instrumental anyone's ever been able to talk about at length or just wax about with them. Well, there were some sounds that led into the next song. But anyways, yeah, and obviously I'm being facetious, but it's a fun track. And I also think it's a reset track. I think it's a mind cleaning I think of Demon Cleaner by Caius or some Melvin stuff going on. But yeah, definitely there, you know, some of that uh, desert sound. Queens of the Stone. Anyways, yeah, yeah I don't yeah. know. It's a, it's a reset button. Yeah, if you're looking for tool influences, Caius and the Melvins are good places to start too. So it's interesting that you say it's a reset track because it leads into the last you know, full song on the album, which is called Tempest. Uh, it's stylized with the number seven that stands in for the T in the word. But, you know, Maynard sings in the, the track, you know, he says the word Tempest. So I'm just going to say that that's how it's pronounced. Although the seven is a, a reference to the one. There are seven songs on the album, like seven full songs without the instrumentals. And they did record the album in, I believe, seven from a from a scale perspective. I'm not really sure if that's accurate. I'm not a musician, but you can correct me if I'm wrong there. But Tempest is interesting. I've done some counting, and it sounds pretty accurate. 
Okay, perfect. So, but Tempest is an interesting track. One, it's the longest track on the album. It might be the longest track they've ever recorded. I did not verify that, but it's almost 16 minutes long. And it's a fucking trip, man. It's not a chocolate chip trip like we were just talking about. It's a whole different kind of trip. But it's interesting that, like I said, that you said this, the instrumental leading into this track was a reset because this track, man, to me, it's kind of dark. It's it's kind of um, a perspective shift almost. I think it goes back to letting fear dictate your perspective, but I think the perspective has shifted away from an individual to somebody looking at that same individual. You know, this Tempest is, by definition, like a, a violent windstorm. And I think this is like an outsider, going back to the uh, A Perfect Circle song, looking at someone who's going through this journey of doing what they can to improve and to change and to just be a better human being for themselves and for other people around them but still sort of doubting them, still viewing them as this violent windstorm that could start up at any moment. And, you know, I think that's a a common perspective for a lot of people. When you look at people who have struggled, you think, well, you know, you just sort of doubt them. Like, well, they're not capable of change or they're not trying to change. When in reality, like, man, if you're honest with yourself, like, that's the first step, first of all. And if you know you're changing, but somebody else on the outside is telling you that you are not, or making you feel like you're not changing for the better, it's a whole other process. It's a whole other sort of obstacle to overcome during that process. And I think that, you know, we sometimes, all of us get stuck in this debilitating mental pattern of not thinking others can change, which I think is actually more reflective of ourselves and thinking that we are the ones who can't change. So we just sort of project that out to other people. But I think at the end of the day, no matter who it is, give them credit for what they're trying to do. It might not be an immediate overnight success, but be willing to offer them compassion and support and love because know that deep in your heart, that deep in their heart, they are trying to become better for themselves and for you, and for your relationships, and your connections, and that goes back to the first song where I said I was struggling with connecting with other people, and that that might have been a fear of mine that I was trying to overcome here recently. I think The Tempest is taking that sort of from this other perspective of, like, here I am trying to do this for myself, and then in a way for you as well, but being doubted that I can't do it, and just, you're just waiting for that windstorm inside of me to just, you know, start up at any moment. So, wow, I rambled on, and I don't know if any of that made sense, but you have the microphone now, man. That was astoundingly beautiful. I am, um, <laughs> I think it's raining in here. Uh, someone better check the sprinklers. Oh, there's no sprinklers in here. I, I'm just uh, the building is just uh, the maintenance is just alerted to me that there is no sprinklers in this room. Um. So that being said, that was uh, incredibly beautiful, and I I had not thought about it from that point of view. Um. But that's almost like meta again that it took you to tell me, and like that's amazing that you can see it like that because I first of all can I can I can appreciate that I can see it from that way before I address that. Because that would take other le- that would take me time to think about. I'll quickly say what I've had up till now for the song, which is that, yeah, I like how it was a reset. Um, this one is the to me my original my my hot take was um, that this is the no bullshit song. This was the do what you fucking need to do. It doesn't matter. Just be what you're gonna be. It doesn't matter if people doubt you. You will be what you're going to be, and you will do that even if that world is burning down. My girlfriend likes to say that even if she lost an arm, she would still be making jewelry. You know how I know it's true? I cut her arm off. She's still making jewelry. No, I'm kidding. She really would, though. (laughs) A, a, A very talented astrologer, I believe one of the two that I mentioned earlier, told me that people who are comedians who are good at comedy, like Bill Hicks, right, are very... Saturnian, they have a ton of Capricorn energy. They have well aspected Capricorn. And it's like, well, that's the most dark and serious one. I'm like, yeah, comedian. Anyways, so the point is, is that the um Tempest is a for a force of nature that will whirl without anyone anyone's whim. It's like, well, I never ever do a thing about a, a, a thing about the weather because the weather never ever does a thing for me. You know, so, you know, you can watch your own weather change and that's a product of your will. So again, a tempest will be just that. I'm going to become a better person no matter what. I've made several changes in my life. I I started down a path a few years ago that I 
I can say my life is now divided into chapters where I feel like it's not that's not me after like before 2014, but it's a very different Saturnian return version of me and where I'm at now. And it's boring almost to hear people talk at length about themselves. Me, 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 I, 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 well, let's work on that. All, all of us, all of us without becoming like, it's like, well, no borders. Well, okay. No keys to your house. Where does that as above, so below. And by the way, to jump back quickly to uh, invincible, we, I meant to mention that video that he did with Joe Rogan in it. Uh, that was, um, you know, about, um, oh, sorry, that was a different one for Pussifer. He did one with the old Luchadero or whatever it is, like trying to put on his, that's a great video that I think that must be on Maynard's mind. If you're, you know, his name's not even Maynard. He made that character up when he was 12. But anyways, so his, uh, his autobiography is very interesting. It has uh, an interesting cover and everything. So um, check it out. But uh, the point is, is back to the Tempest. The Tempest will be just that. Whenever I listen to the song, I get fiercely determined. I don't care who doubts me. I don't care. It's not relevant. They are swept away. My tidal wave is the Hokusai. I am come. I am an atomic bomb. Let's hope I can bring some good things. Like uh, imagine a, a golden seed. A seed's an atomic bomb. The way it blows up and then grows. So yeah golden seed anyways i think that's what i'm trying to say my interpretation of it was i didn't think about it from the someone doubting externally i thought about it like now you've been through this like chocolate chip trip you're all squeegeed and you're ready to face it now you're you stripped away you're who you are and now it's time to rock as we would say let's rock here we go again right as the uh the opening lyrics to that song say and I think another phrase to throw out, the winds of change, which I meant to say when I was talking earlier, but the winds of change are upon us, this windstorm. So <laughs> it's almost going to like Arizona Bay, the whole thing, you know, it's going to wash yeah. it all away. Well, I want to say that it's important that we add the whole like um, Jake Kotze made this great video about Trump's penis. Oh, more penis, penis, penis. Take a shot if you're listening or or take a hit. It's a, uh, it's, uh, we said penis. Um, so when you when you think about this video that he put together with um oh what's the song i um it's like um god what are they called it's, it's this tech it's not metric it's this band voice wakes up oh it's, yeah, uh, yeah 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 that song this oh man you should uh, anyways great song though i mean now that we're talking about this but that that whole idea that trump's talking about um that he you know here's the storm is coming you know I had this big, I, I meant, you know, you mentioned my show before I did on one of my shows, six of swords, six of wands, six of cups, six of discs. On one of them, I mentioned that meme meme is a maternal aspect of Pepe. Mm, Pepe. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. I noticed the meme and Pepe, right. Mama, Papa. And I was like, Oh, so this is why the Pepe thing was the side of memes that was related to get this, this ties in Jordan B. Peterson when he first was becoming popular, actually tweeted at me when I tweeted to him, disgustipated, which was until Tempest, the longest tool song. And he says, wow, that's like a punch in the mouth. That's what he said about the tool song. And then people started making YouTubes of my thing with Jordan Peterson. And it was kind of, it became a weird, small thing tool Peterson and I, but that's the Pepe right thing. After that, that guy in Boston got punched in the mouth and of course, it's around the time that I got hit in the mouth by no agenda. So the point is that there's all these weird, like meta contextual tool things happening with this. And also, I was just in New York. And all I can say is that people who like Fear Inoculum should go to New York and listen to Fear Inoculum in New York, uh, preferably in the Manhattan area or Brooklyn area or, or uh, you know Harlem area. I'm going to see Tool with Killing Joke. In November in New York, there's all these weird seven 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 sinks and Astaroth and Tool in New York. So people should definitely check out the Australian version of Tool's Anima CD to see more. But anyways, I really feel like that was a good way to kind of vapor mist some mystery in there. But yeah, man, this song's fucking powerful, and it really does seem to mean that we're on the brink of something, and we better make the right decision if you're at a crossroads and there's a fucking fire coming at you and you need to go down one of those roads 
well, that's called time evaporating, but also the intensity of the internet and how all of the main, the world is getting super connected and we're heading towards 5G and AI. This is an all new frontier for humanity. We're going to have to make a decision. We must make collectively a decision with courage, clarity, and unstoppable will. The decision to be free, to be able to think for ourselves, and the ability to be loving. Because I really fucking feel like that's what this song is telling me right now. Which brings us to the last track, which is another instrumental. It's a nice little outro to the album, or maybe it's a, a spiral back to the beginning of the album in some way. It's called Mocking Beat. You mentioned earlier that you wanted to share something specific about it. So, you know, I don't have any interpretive lens to view this track through. I didn't make any notes on it, but I knew that you had tweeted something about it a while ago. And I don't know if that's what you're talking about, but please share, you know, what this track means or the syncs that you've experienced with it. Yeah. I mean, like at this point, meaning is as good as anyone else because you've already shared some really, uh, there's some, you know, there's very cool thing. I like hearing what other people have to say. I really love that. Like, it's like there's poetry and then there's poetry. And so in mocking beat, I had written this. Ah, I'm having such a joyful little synchronicity here. Cause what did I just talk about? The AI entrainment? Yeah. The eighth sphere, our harmonic dark journalist and hi, Olivia. Hi, sis kind of stuff. Definitely. Please keep that in there. The idea is that like, we're looking at this pattern entrainment, like the same reason that the slip cover on lateralis was the, uh, the same reason that the album was the factory made one and the ingrained one and the entrained one. And you had to break that apart. So, Poor little birds around here, actual physical birds in the ma- in the majesty of creation here have been in, tr- in this manifestation have been the majesty of creation is manifestation. Cool. Uh, these birds got all fucking ingrained with the car alarms. Yo, I wrote this blog post a little while ago and I noticed I just finally had to say something because I've noticed it for a year or so. I don't know how long now. Mockingbirds tend to make whatever sound the other birds make and. It's kind of predatory or weird, and that's kind of gets into this. But you're looking at how these birds are now making the sound of a car alarm. They don't have any other dominant frequency as dominant as a machine to replicate. So nature is getting raped by the raptor of the machine. And uh, these birds, uh, this is is also kind of cool that we mentioned Disgustipated and Jordan Peterson a second ago and the weird sync I had with him. And the whole, I just realized Mimi is Pepe is the father side is the, the subconscious versus anyways. So what we're in young and uh, what we're looking and learn to swim. So what we're looking at prying open the third eye, that's enough 46 and two and eight stop. Okay. So the point is, is that we're looking at how the machine can easily overwhelm the humans, like with a frequency, like you see how one metronome starts ticking until the other ones all start following it, a dominant frequency kind of thing. Which tool would be like, nah, you, you know, you, when you want to be in a frequency together, that's good, but you don't want to be raped into it. So these birds have been like raped into thinking that's their song, if you get the metaphor there. So now their voice is speaking the machine's voice and they don't have one anymore. I'm surprised that they haven't started laying little eggs that look like engines, engine blocks. But so the point is, is I wrote an article about this, and then it seems to me that we're looking at this song that's talking about what sounds like mockingbirds but it's very electronic and the way that they're doing it sounds very much like what these birds did and i was struck by that to the point where i was just like whoa but it goes further than that because the reason i mentioned disgustipated is because i think that tools making fun of themselves just like they make fun of everything they make they're at the point where they're mature and wise enough they know the karma needs to be that they also poke at themselves or they just feel like doing it or whatever it is and disgustipated, you have them being all like hard, angsty, and yeah, life's gonna feed on life, man. You gotta deal with that. Life feeds on life. It's hard, you know. And they were like being all aggressive, and that was kind of like how they they're now they're making fun of themselves for being like that. And you got this thing. Before I carry on, did you happen to notice any kind of like words or things being said during this that you could make out patterns? What did it's what came to your mind? Because it's going to be different. So what what did you hear before I go on? I don't think I had heard anything lyric wise or word wise that I could say it stands out to me. I I heard like the chirping I think of a bird I guess, but I didn't really 
I don't know. Maybe I haven't paid much attention to it. I haven't really listened to it that much. I think I've only heard it maybe two or three times, to be honest. I listened to the album, especially because I wanted to be ready for this interview. But, you know, actually, it was literally for this interview. I'm like, by that time, I need to have listened to it this many times. I think I got to between nine and 11. So probably at 10 listens just through today. And I listened to Mocking Jay, or sorry, Mocking Beat. Mocking Jay, what's that? It's a different. Oh, that's that freaking Hunger Games book. That's, that's Hunger the Games, yeah. <laughs> direction the society can go if we do not make the right decisions. Good one. Hey, whoa, it could be part of it. Who knows, right? I might have just been, you know, useful fool, uh, useful tool there. Actually, dude, my, nah, that's a story for another time. I have all sorts of weird things with tool back in high school. I even had all of their albums, including Salival, as a Stonehenge on my desk. And I never thought about it. It was just like those were supposed to be there. No other CD did I keep in that manner or even anyways. That point goes uh, importantly there because what I'm about to say is this, actually. That's probably relevant in the way that I'm going to say what I heard was them making fun of themselves in a way going, it's nature, it's nature, it's nature. You know, so they're like saying, we're making a chilled, like, relaxed outro beat. And we're like the complete opposite vibe spectrum wise from like where it was like, oh, life feeds on life. It's a pirate chanty or whatever. And then you get to the point where it's, you know, just like it's nature. That's what it does. It's what it does, bro. So it's like completely like when you see like the the cool stoner dude and like the really spazzy stoner dude. It's like whatever, man. It's just he's like all high up on his thing, saying like all this stuff, and then other dudes just like, yeah, is this? And then something shifts in the energy, and everyone's just like, and that, the guy who's like way up in the air is just like, whoa. And so like I think it's kind of like that thing where it's like he's like, oh, it's it's nature, it's nature. But here's where it gets weird, and here's where it gets completely insane. And this is the caveat that you do not have to listen to this in. <laughs> this, that is just the strangest thought I had as I was leaving New York City and listening to the album on the bus ride back. More times when I was eating some friendly cannabis, the, the lovely green lady. Uh, she did, I didn't choke that evening. It was, a, it was a very nice bus ride, the loveliest bus ride. I'm um, listening to Fear Inoculum on my way back. And at the end of the first listen through on the way back, you get two listens on a bus ride to Manhattan from Boston, Port Authority, whatever. You get uh, you get uh, to the end of it for the first time listening, and I hear because I'm thinking, and I'll tell you what, it will help if I preface it with what I'm what the crazy thing I'm about to say right now with what I'm going to say now, which sounds completely legitimate, and insane. So take it for what you will. Um, think for yourself. Question authority. Question Nathan Lee. Looking at how you and I are actually like not that hidden. Like we're on the world stage in a way and people are actually listening to this right now. And there's not very many other people who have done podcasts about such topics. You get where I'm going with this? I started to hear Nathan, Nathan, Nathan Lee. <laughs> I literally started hearing Nathan Lee in the background of the thing. And I'm thinking to myself, this is the most absurd thought you have ever had in your life. You need to stop thinking this thought right now. <laughs> right? Like, like shutting myself down and being like, that's just silly, obviously. Why would that happen? But then this flood of just, okay, well, honestly, the flood was first. And then I just kept going and I tried to like mitigate it. But then it was resumed. And I said, you know what? Let's just look at this for fun. Ryan and I have talked about the Holy Gift talked and we've done it in podcast form and all this other stuff and there's all these other things that were in my head but it really like you know thoughts <laughs> or whatever you call it numa and i was like yeah that's the weirdest silliest thing but then again there i am the guy who wrote the article about the same phenomenon in a way that's totally the legitimate interpretation of the track and maybe you'll want to like link so that people can read that thing i'm sure you were going to do that anyways but whatever i think that like I don't know, man. I, I, I think I have said enough. I th I'm feeling some weird, like, cosmic destiny thing. And it's just like, I don't even want to fucking talk about it. I just want to, like, enjoy the feeling. And so I've said it. I, I, like, I wasn't even going to bring that up. But, like, it's my one interpretation. And it doesn't even matter. Everyone in the world could say that's not what it is. But my tempest is going to storm forward all the same. Amen, dude. That was great. That was beautiful. Um, so I guess as we wrap up the discussion here about the album, we should I'll probably mention the artwork. Do you have any thoughts Duh. on... Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is such a big part of their 
persona as a band, whether it's their album notes or liners or covers or their stage show even, which I'm curious to see. I also have tickets to see them in November of all months as well. So I am curious to see like what their stage show is in terms of, you know, I don't expect a lot of like differences from their past shows in terms of the, the get up, but I'm, I just, I like watching the videos and seeing like what they're going to put up there. So, but in did terms you of see that, any of the other tours before? Oh yeah. I've only seen them on the lateralis and the 10,000 days tours. And then I saw them during the 13 year hiatus between albums. I saw them a couple of times too. So, okay. Yeah. But anyways, back to the artwork. What do you make of the artwork of the album or any associated artwork that came with this album? Sure. Yeah. Um, I'll love to get into that. It's just, you mentioned the concert part because I feel like that's a vital aspect and maybe we can talk about that after the art, but I feel like there's the art, the music, and then the actual performance. And we should get into that at some point tonight or today, or whatever it is, people listening, um, Infinity. And yeah, I think that the main thing that I noticed about the art was that it's one of those things that reminds me of the Salvador Dali painting of Abraham Lincoln from Far Away, which was one of my favorite pieces. Dali's probably my favorite artist, if not top 10. And I totally actually feel like I'm an incarnation of Dali, even though we were both live at the same time. Like, I don't, and I mean, by that, he that Dali was an incarnation of Nathan Lee Miller Foster. That said, it looks like one of those paintings that you can see from very far away and very close up and get a different impression from it. First of all, just like if you're looking at all of humanity, we are all, all the individual consciousnesses, but we're all also one gigantic eye. So it's like a meta, it looks like a bunch of little consciousnesses and then it's a big swirl of an eye. And it's also a spiral. It's a spiral case that you can see from either an upwards looking or it's one of those interesting images that can be bent to see the angle from whence it comes. And it can be bent to look upwards or downwards, depending. So where is that gigantic stream of consciousness going? And that's what I, that has to do with the Dane Red Yar ascending and descending and climbing the heck a lot or however it goes. The pace of Wu or Yu or Chu or Zu or Mu. Who? Ah, but anyways, so now I've started drawing tarot cards and it's going to be distracted. But um, just to be, just to be fair, I, well, anyways, I won't tell you what I drew. But um, yeah, I think that the upwards ascending art and the downwards ascending art from the, the booklet that came with the video inside of it, which I don't have that physical copy. I did not choose to buy the CD version with a disc thing. I chose to wait for vinyl because I'm a vinyl guy. So that's where I will be getting my physical copy. I did purchase the Digi, but that's what are you going to do? But yeah, no, I didn't go crazy about that. I wasn't even interested in getting a copy of it. In fact, I was in New York doing tool-related things when that whole thing was going on, in Central Park, no less. But that being said, I was um, struck by how the concept of upwards evolution is made. Like It's like they're trying to make it like direct and clear now using the best archetypes and the best modality possible. Like, again, the spirally artwork on the what we shall call like the physical album for now. The main artwork was that eye, right? I guess uh, it's hard to say. I guess the physical artwork was all different. Um, I didn't really get too into the physical artwork myself yet either. I've seen like pictures of the booklet, but it looked like a lot of just amplified combinations of lateralis and 10,000 days, in my opinion. And that's not a learned opinion. I'll have more to say someday, but um. I didn't really get that much into it besides really being struck by the triple headed or the triple crowned or the hierophanty looking uh, mental state of the either downwards or upwards. And I align myself with the upwards uh, positioned created being who has having an experience that is obviously like, you know, it's multidimensional. So I was struck by that. And it seems like it had a lot to do with like what consciousness is and how it works and how would you like it to work? How would you like it to work, little boy? You know what I mean? So anyways, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of well, like that. What do you have to say about the performance aspect then? Because I agree. I mean, seeing these guys in concert, in performance is a whole different experience than just listening to their albums on vinyl or MP3 or wherever. I mean, it's a different magical sort of environment to experience the music in, which is maybe even beyond music. It's, I don't know. I think this album is very symphonic, very orchestral in a way. So I'm interested to see like what songs they play off of it in this fall tour. And you know, what other songs from the back catalog that they sort of pair with it, because, you know, I know they're very cognizant of that in-person live experience. So, but what is there to say about the performance aspect to this? You think? Well, I would hope to hear 46 and 2 and push it, just throwing that out there. 
you know, if they happen to listen to this show. <laughs> Speak it into existence, right? There you go. Oh my goodness. At least push it. I think that you and I have had like, uh, I think that's a good song for us to understand the reality in a way. Cause like, if we if we if we look at that gap, that gap could be the, like looking at the 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 branch in the water. You know, we want to look at the, the 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 communion and what keeps us together before the fire burns the hole through. We want to look at what keeps us in reasonable together. You know what I mean? Like like constructive because we all need our own free time to breathe. Like even in relationships with you know the girlfriend, she needs time to make her stuff. I need time to make my stuff. But without one another, either like. Somehow it wouldn't be as complete either. But that being said, I think that um, the concert aspect, it's kind of like that. It's actually just like a relationship. It is. It's, it's a big old orgy. Um, it's a loving. <laughs> it's a ritual. It's, a, um, it's, it's magic. And it is important. I've, I've only seen them live like twice or once for the 10,000 days. You know that I had some interesting circumstances with why I couldn't see them for lateralis. In 2002, in July or whatever it was, I saw them in 2007 for 10,000 days. But after that, I didn't bother. I didn't want to see them in 2013 when they came around, I think it was, or whatever, for like the Boston. Um, like they were going to be in Boston playing a, some bunch of other shows and stuff. You know what I mean? And the whole thing was like Facebook only or some weird thing. And I don't use Facebook. I haven't for years. And it just something seemed like so like fucking surveillance about it that I didn't want to go because it's tool and I love tool, but freedom it's just gonna be amazing. Uh, Killing Joke is another one of my favorite bands like Todd Rundgren, Killing Joke, Kate Bush, Bjork, Madonna, like all of that. Cocteau Twins, that kind of stuff's very important to me, and it's magic music or mu- music magic, whatever. It's one and the same. And seeing them with Tool, holy bejesus, you know what I mean? It's just going to be potent off the charts. We're in the place that uh, Astaroth has dominion, and it's just going to be amazing. It's, it's going to be a very wonderful time. Seven, 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 sevens everywhere. And uh, yeah, we're going to see Tool play across like the world like better than they have probably for the last few. I bet they're really going to put a lot into making this like shoot like if this is the last time danny can carry can pick up his drumsticks according to whatever he said in that article they're gonna be like you know turning 11 up to 11 you feel i do feel and i am very much looking forward to the experience it is always an experience it's also a very different experience each time you see them i've seen them probably six or seven times so i don't know but each show has been different and yeah. there was there was one tour where I saw them the same week because they were in two cities around me. And I just went to both. And I saw the same set list both nights. They did not vary the set list at all, which is fine. They actually don't do that very much. You know, they may swap out a song or two on the same tour. But for the most part, it's the same set list for the entire duration of their... Which makes it so tour. much easier. Yeah. It, well, it makes it a consistent experience for everyone, including the band. You know what I mean? So, but so that's true. That's a good point. But within the but within that experience, it's also very different because we're all experiencing this subjectively, as Bill Hicks says in uh, his bit about acid. Take right? the ride. So you know, I don't really have much more to say on this album. We have covered a lot of ground in all different aspects of it. I really appreciate you making the time today to chat with me about it. I know we've had some scheduling issues where we had to push this back, and but we're here. We did it. We've inoculated ourselves against fear. It's exactly well we recorded this one month after it came out but. yeah like literally like moon cycle like that's yeah. an amazing like this is kind of probably meant to happen <laughs> sure i have no idea when I, i'll release it though so it will be oh out there. no what i'm no 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 i'm saying it's i'm not okay let's definitely inoculate ourselves against any judgments or anything because all i'm saying is that i had like like i didn't choose like what license plate number i'd get i didn't choose like all of these things and it, it brings us back to that something can move us around the board. And I feel like this was meant to happen literally right now. Well, I would agree with that. And I'm glad that we're here now to doing it. I'm glad that we did the damn thing and it's done. So I've been looking forward to this chat for a while. And, you know, I hope that when the audience hears it, that if they're not familiar with the band or this album in particular, just, you know, seek it out. It really is, like I said, an orchestral symphonic. I don't know if I call it a masterpiece, but it's pretty fucking close if it's not. Because, so that's that's good because we're not still recording there, right? 
No, we are. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay, good, good. Okay, well, if we are, then I want to. I, I think there's one bit that we should do before we like before we finish, 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 which would be like, you know, let's, I mean, this is kind of like bearing our balls here, but uh, how would you rate the album? Well, that's interesting because, like I said, when I first heard it, I really wasn't a fan of the whole thing, you know, and needed like multiple listens to really become comfortable with it, and then to not just become comfortable with it, but enjoy it as well. So I think after several listens, you know, have I listened to it 10 times all the way through? Probably. And I would say that I still, I don't like to compare it to their other stuff because it is a, a different animal, but I, I, th- I think I would rank it just behind Lateralis as my favorite album of theirs and right above Anima because I think it's more mature then Anima, which is, you know, very tongue-in-cheek throughout, it is very funny, and it does show that more humorous side of, of their personas, while maintaining that sort of, you know, dark aspect to their work that they've sort of become known for, that, you know, that traditional metal, I guess, persona that they put on sometimes. But I think this is, with age, it has become their most mature work as well, you know? I don't know if that was an intentional thing, but, you know, like the Adam Jones part in Tempest, I don't know how long it took him to write that, I've heard it took him 13 years to write that and that that was a big part of, you know, the process of delaying the album was was perfecting like that particular kind of thing, you know. So regardless, though, I think it's the most mature work I've heard from them. I like it. I appreciate it for what it is, but it's not my favorite album of theirs yet. It could be, though, because it, it does, I think it does what I think all good pieces of art should do. It tells a complete story throughout. And it also Ouroboruses itself, where it eats itself and goes back into itself, you know, in a way. Like, it's kind of like the Holy Gift, you know? It's where, it, when you rearrange those tracks, it it's one complete experience that spirals in and out of itself. And I think that, that this does the same thing, you know? Yeah, I, I like that, because um, I was wondering, like, what like what it re- lays in wait to be revealed about what this can be, if it... If it was already created, knowing it could be like super repositioned, like every song, or if it's just, okay, you just do it this way, or maybe there's two again or three or, um, but yeah, like I like the part where he said that he had like a guitar riff from Anima that he used in this since he brought Anima up and like, you know, there's that whole thing where they go like, again, like where they were like showing their maturity. Cause before he was like, I got to bring my mic back a bit. Cause I'm going to do it where he's going with the yogic breathing and for Anima starting off with hey, 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 hey. like it's, it's a sharp knife <laughs> yeah. attack of sound. But like now in this one, they have them kind of just rather than yelling at you and bludgeoning you with it. I believe at the beginning of the Tempest, maybe it is. He's just like, Hey, Hey, you know, like, hey, like whisper, whisper, you know, by the way, by the way, so it's kind of like, if you want to, hey, there's this way to go. So I, 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 I'm really glad. I would have regretted forgetting bringing that up today. So I'm glad we got that bit in there. But um, ultimately, the control your delusions, you know, make sure that it's your delusion that you're controlling. It doesn't matter what other people are saying, right? Again, I wanted to add that. But um, yeah, I think that the whole thing is a cohesive piece. I'm going to rate it as... It fluxes, but I'm gonna give it an I'm gonna give it an A, A plus being like Dark Side of the Moon probably, or Todd Grungren's Utopia from 19 I believe 74 or three or or his acapella. But um yeah, I mean there's very rarely a, a perfect album. I'd have to say Kate Bush's 50 Words for Snow or her Ariel fit that. But this one's damn close. It's damn close. It's damn close. There's a few parts where I get a little looking around now. Looking around. Any Tool fans around here? Okay. I get a little bored once in a while during some of the parts. I think it's during descending some parts yeah. of the tempest. It's not always, it's, it's a lot of my own, like, am I distracted? Am I really engaged? How involved am I? But you know, again, a really good album that I would rate as an A, like is the Holy gift. And up and almost until this interview, I was going to rate fear inoculum higher but because I'm just so swept up in how much I'm enjoying it right now. But I had to temper that with knowing that it's not as good. Ultimately, I just already know that, but it's not like I'm trying to shut myself down from embracing it. It's just more like, all right, is it, could it possibly be? Well, the Holy gift, first of all, is it's kind of like a beyond album. So to compare it to lateralis, 
I don't know, man. They're pretty, um, the, you know, Anima, Lateralis, and Pure Inoculum are kind of vying, depending on how I feel, you know, my wa- watching my weather change. I don't ever have to worry about, what is it, 72686 or 7, I don't know. It's whatever spells Satan on the phone. I don't have to worry about opiate or, I, I love Undertow, but even Undertow or 10,000 Days. Those are, those three albums kind of swirl about right now. Really like the Holy Gift the best, though. Beyond album, it's a plus ultra album. Yeah, yeah, for sure, absolutely. It's a fan album, you know. It's by us for us, essentially. So it's spirit. Um, absolutely, man. Well, hey, Nathan Lee Miller Foster, really appreciate you being here again, man. This is your third time on the show, and it's always fun to to hear you work through this stuff in in real time. And I'm I'm glad that you made the time to do that. So uh, tell people before we go where they can find you know your podcast and your Twitter handle and, and such things and such. Yeah. I make it up as I go along. I have a Pisces rising like a uh, freighter Xavier of mind and magic. So like I find that's especially efficacious for occulty things because we just go in the flow. Yo, uh, like a tempest. Oh, so you can go to occultfan.com. Uh, that's like nine letters. And then it's like 13 with the dot com. You also will find my show, the six of swords. It's my flagship show. It's the Six of Series is what I'm calling it for now, but that's the Six of Swords, Six of Cups. Six of Swords is a one-on-one like Ryan and I are doing right now. It's about art, spirituality, and healing. Six of Cups is a pleasurable roundtable. Big fan favorite right now is the one with uh, Bishop Alan Greenfield and my buddy Jake, who is a fellow 22. He's uh, March 22nd. I'm September 22nd. And uh, then we have the Six of Wands. It's a live show you can call in. And Six of Discs is a personal pet project show. So you can check all of those out on iTunes. I like to use Podcast Addict. But uh, if you can't find it, message me at occultfan at gmail.com. Also, the place to go is the Six of Swords Discord. We will be having, uh, just yesterday, the official Invisibles reading group has now begun. You can join the Invisibles reading group. It's $11.11. $11. And you'll get access to the secret Discord. You'll get a few real material quality things coming your way. And uh, those will be disclosed. But only to those who are on the Six of Swords uh, Discord, you'll get into the Invisibles reading group in there. And what we're going to be doing as a group project, a group magical project, is reading the Invisibles all together I've uh, been getting messages about it, even though i got to clear my phone now. <laughs> but yes, um, join that if you wish. Uh, that's Occult Fan at PayPal uh, for the $11.11. It's a one-time thing, and you're into the Discord's channel. Uh, if you have any issues, occultfan at gmail.com. And again, uh, the main site, thank you, Ryan, for asking, is occultfan.com. And that's occultfan at the Twitters. Little birds, mocking, mocking beat birds. Absolutely, man. Well, hey, for real, thanks again. Really appreciate it. Really enjoyed the chat. Hope to talk to you soon, man. Yeah, this was great. And honestly, um, the real work is doing what we talked about. It's This is real. We have to do this. It's not. It doesn't end with the turning off of the podcast or the interview. It's This goes on. A Tempest must be just that. And there you have it. My thanks again to Nathan Lee Miller Foster. Please do give him a follow on Twitter or check out his Six of Swords podcast if you like what you heard here. I don't have much more to add to this. I think this conversation spoke for itself. I guess the only thing I would say if I'm forcing myself to say something additional here is that we need more of this. And by this, I mean art with a capital A and analysis also with a capital A of that art. Creative works are such an influential part of our experience here, whether we consciously recognize it or not. Words, images, and sounds embed themselves not only into our subconscious, but also into our physical bodies, into our blood and bones. There's a reason why music makes you want to move, to dance, because it infects you. And like a virus, it just forces your body to acknowledge its presence inside you. And I think too, from a health and wellness perspective, art is a key ingredient that no one talks about when it comes to physical and mental health. We know now that your mental and psychological and emotional health is linked to your gut health. So many says out there that demonstrate a sort of symbiosis between your gut and your brain. But if you're talking about health from a holistic perspective, then everything you expose your mind and body to is affecting that. Is it a coincidence that, for example, here in America that we have maybe the highest rates of addiction and obesity of any developed country, and we also have the most debased music on our radio stations and the most debased films in our theaters? I mean, mumble rap, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, 
are you sure these things we're being subjected to on a mass level are healthy for our psyches? I mean, I get escapism on some level, you know, putting on a vinyl or a film and just unplugging, so to speak, but what are you trying to escape from to begin with? I don't know if art should be an escape. I think it should be an enhancement. I think we owe it to ourselves to expose ourselves to things that enhance our experience here, not keep us in this psychological and physiological bondage that we seem to be stuck in. I don't know, maybe I'm making too much of this topic and I'm not saying a new fucking Tool album is part of a path to some newfound blessed immunity against all the toxicity that we're subjected to on a daily basis. But what I am saying is that how do you know it's not? I mean, if you're a believer or a practitioner of the magical or alchemical arts, then you know damn well how much influence words, (coughs) spells, and images, (coughs) sigils, have over our experience here. I guess all I'm saying is, you know, be careful and be cognizant of what you let enter your eyes and your ears, because that's going to affect your health just as much as what you're eating and how much you're exercising. I don't mean exercising as an exorcism, but we could probably do a bit of that too by choosing to purge ourselves and our shelves of the demons and the deceivers that we've allowed to coagulate in and around us. And sheesh, you know, for not having much to add, I sure did add a lot there. Hope I didn't come off too preachy, but that really is my own personal uh, POV these days. Anyway, my thanks to new patron Ron for hopping on the Patreon campaign recently. There was no Patreon extension here because I wanted the free audience to hear this in its entirety. I thought it just made sense that way. But patrons will get an extension in the next episode, our penultimate episode, our annual Halloween episode too. That's episode 143. And then episode 144, our final one, is as of now two and a half hours. I'm also going to release that, I believe, in its entirety for everyone. But patrons will get an epilogue episode of sorts after that final episode. So there is still some incentive to sign up for the Patreon, not to mention if you're a new-ish listener, you get access to all the Patreon extensions dating back to 2018 at some point, which is when I started doing them. I believe it was episode 77 where the bonus material started, so that's patreon.com slash occulture if you're interested. Anyway, that brings this cacophonous crescendo of antisocial commentary to an end. Please do hit subscribe so you don't miss the final two episodes here. They are, uh, if I may say, tremendously entertaining for very different reasons. So until next time, you've just been initiated into a culture. I am Ryan Perverly reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority. Please rewind this cassette.